What's up, film fans? Every once in a while, an individual, or more generally, a group, gets together and they take it to the man. They figure out that a system's not working for most of the people. Uh, it could be a system of government, it could be a, a corporate system, whatever it is. They figure out that certain laws aren't working and they swarm, they infiltrate, they uh, overwhelm, whatever it might be, and they begin to dismantle that system and put something else in its place. Something that oftentimes is better, benefits more people, um, at the very least brings a breath of fresh air into a system that had grown stale. Unfortunately, almost every time that happens, the man catches on and slaps back. I'm Aaron Hunter. Join me as we consider studio realignment and re-entrenchment in this episode of The Rise and Fall of New Hollywood. Before we get into it, a quick caveat. As with all the videos in this series, there are some things that I'm not going to be able to get into in this video. Um, you know, these things are already kind of getting long enough, right? <laughs> so there'll be things that I don't cover and things that I give a kind of superficial overview of. Um, that's just to be expected in here. Happy to get into it in the comments below. Um, when I talk about studio realignment and studio re-entrenchment, if you haven't watched the first two videos in this series about the studio system, you might benefit from checking those out. I did one on the roots of the studio collapse, and you can find that here. And then later I did another one about the state of the studio system, or the studios, as the system was already collapsing in the late 60s at the dawn of New Hollywood, and you can find that here. The short version, if you haven't watched those, is that by the end of the 60s, for a host of reasons that I go into in the other videos, the studio system was kind of on the ropes and the studios, most of the major studios, Paramount, Warner Brothers, United, uh, Columbia, uh, MGM, had all been purchased by um, a different variety of multinational conglomerates, or in one case that I'll get into later, a um, secretive, private, but extremely rich real estate baron and these purchases injected cash into the studios and for a while for the sort of late 60s and into the 70s um, a modicum of artistic and creative freedom and the reason for that generally was that the people who ran the companies like Charles Bludorn who ran Gulf Western or Ted Ashley who ran Kenny National Gulf Western had bought Paramount, Kenny National, Warner Brothers, was that they didn't know much about the movie business. They saw a industry in collapse, which if you're a co sort of corporate raider type person, I assume, I'm not one, is a right time to get in, right? And if you can rebuild something to its once former glory, even if in a different state, woohoo, there's money to be made. And that's what they did. So through the late 60s to the early 70s, the studios were bought up by non-movie people. And they were happy at the time to let creatives run the companies. So you had people like Robert Evans running Paramount. Evans came from an actor's background. You had John Cally running Warner Brothers, who had actually worked his way up from the NBC mailroom. So had a kind of intimate and intricate knowledge of how the studio worked or how the business worked, let's say. You had David Begelman from Columbia who actually started out in a creative arts agency and was one of the people who was involved in the uh, package unit system, which I talked about in that first Studio Collapse video. These were people who came from various corners of the screen media, particularly movie world, and were involved in the management, in the promotion of the creative side of Hollywood. And that just happened to align with this new era of directors, this new um, generation of filmgoers who were looking for um, 
a realignment of Hollywood's creativity. And that's how you get New Hollywood. However, <laughs> those men weren't businessmen, with maybe the exception of John Cali and to a lesser extent Bagelman and some of the others. They were creatives. They were on the side of the artists. And that was all well and good when these low budget films were making a lot of money. When Easy Rider was making a lot of money, then Burt Schneider at BBS looked really good. And Columbia, who was kind of a parent of BBS, looked really good. When The Godfather made a ton of money, Bob Evans looked good. Paramount looked good. But things started to happen in the middle of the 70s that I've talked about in previous episodes that made the corporate masters realize there was even more money to be made. We don't just have to rely on these independent-minded filmmakers, these quirky, sometimes troublesome, sometimes maverick filmmakers and their low-budget films. We can engineer films and then promote them in ways that will guarantee or almost guarantee, it's never a guarantee, massive audience. And massive audience means massive dollars, right? Massive box office. This was already going on and I talk a little bit about it in my The Other Films video with the disaster films, um, some of the musicals of the 70s, Disney films still. These were films that were engineered not to tell a personal story, not to challenge America, challenge democracy, challenge the system, challenge corporations, to tell a good, simple, exciting tale and to tell it well. Hollywood had always done both of those things and there's a tension in Hollywood history I've mentioned before between the sort of artistic drive to, to turn film into an art, uh, to make it a vehicle of personal expression and the more commercial, spectacular, let's just sell a lot of tickets. And, and, and that's been there and you can go back to um, Orson Welles and see where there's that sort of Hollywood impetus to take his genius and, and commercialize it and his resistance to it and, and, and many others. Um, so we have this period from 67 to like 75, Jaws, 77, Star Wars, where you're getting the Godfathers and the French Connections and the Shampoos and the Elaine May films, Mikey and Nicky and, and the Heartbreak Kid, and you're getting um, Robert Altman's films, Nashville, being a big deal, even if Jaws sort of surpassed it. Um, but with Jaws and then with Star Wars came the, the notion of the high concept film, which I talk about in the blockbuster, uh, episode. We need films that we can promote. Simple concept, shark terrorizes beach community. And dramatic, conflict-ridden imagery that we can put on posters, right? Jaws is a perfect example. And that can be rolled out as products. Towels, lunch boxes, novelizations, after Star Wars, toys, and so on. Because that's more money. That's the ancillary dollar of Hollywood and of the blockbuster. So all of this was happening at a time when the studios were still in upheaval. So it's not just simply that, ooh, Paramount was bought in 66, Evans came in, and then that was that, and the same thing happened everywhere else with Callie and Bagelman and all the others. There was kind of constant pressure on the studios to keep making money. If somebody failed, they were out, or maybe they got one or two chances, and then they were out. So the early 70s, even though Hollywood began to recover financially, and it had this artistic kind of explosion, it was also a time of constant, perhaps too, turmoil is too sort of strong a word, but controlled chaos. Who's running this? How are they running it? And 
the Blue Dorns and the Kerkorians and others, the Ashleys were willing to step back and watch it happen as long as the money was coming in. But once they realized the potential of these other monetary streams, you have to remember that they were businessmen. They weren't artists. And money trumps everything else. Amidst this controlled chaos, a lot of personal developments were also impacting the way these sort of creative studio heads were running their studios. So Robert Evans, for example, um, who'd had a string of hits from Rosemary's Baby to uh, Love Story to The Godfather to Chinatown, by most accounts, <laughs> became um, high on his own power, became kind of full with his own ego, and he had a massive ego. And if you want to learn more about Robert Evans, I highly recommend the sort of creative documentary, The Kid Stays in the Picture, which is based on his memoir of the same name, which you can also read and is really entertaining. But start with the documentary, because it's, it's a pretty fascinating account of his own rise and fall. Um, he became, like a lot of his talent, um, interested in the extracurricular activities of the 1970s and he became uh, increasingly paranoid like a lot of people did who were involved in those activities. Um, he had a string of sort of personal setbacks in his love life and by the middle of the 70s running the studio was no longer something he wanted to do. He continued to produce films into the 80s and, and later, but he stopped running Paramount in the mid-1970s. Um, Bagelman at Columbia, by all accounts, was doing a fantastic job in the early 70s. Bagelman, like I said, is one of the uh, agents, the creative arts agents, who came up with or who helped develop this idea of the package unit system. And that was something that came in the wake of the 50s studio collapse, where agencies especially sometimes small production companies, would put the film together, right? So they would say, we've got these actors, we've got this director, we've got this scriptwriter. here's a package that we're putting together, and then they would present it to a production company or the studio. And when he rose to be studio head at Columbia, he brought that same approach. And so when he put together a film like Shampoo, he's like, we want Ashby in here, we want Warren Beatty. Beatty was a very creative producer, but he still answered to Bagelman, um, we're gonna bring in Laszlo Kovac to do the cinematography and so on. And he was massively successful with films like Shampoo and then later Close Encounters of the Third Kind and, and many others at Columbia, which is one of the great studios of the 70s. His personal peccadilloes <laughs> involved um, financial irregularities and he became embroiled in 77, 78 in a huge embezzlement financial scandal and was driven out of, of Columbia for those reasons. John Kelly managed to stay at Warner Brothers um, through the 80s and actually adjusted to the new system that I'll talk about fairly well and only left because he'd been running the studio by the time he left for almost 20 years and had some things going on in his personal life and, and didn't want to do it anymore but he also stayed involved in, in film production for, for the rest of his life almost. But many of these creative studio heads, um, for whatever reason, were no longer up to the task. So in came a new generation of studio management. And there's one person in particular I'd like to talk about. He's not the only person who was involved with this. There were many. Um, but he's kind of exemplary of the massive change that the studios underwent in 77, 78, as they pointed towards the end of New Hollywood and the rise of the blockbuster era. And I'm talking about Barry Diller at Paramount. Like John Kelly, Barry Diller also started in the mailroom, only in his case it was at the William Morris Agency in California. And he had family connections and he eventually landed a job at ABC Television. And Diller coming up through the ranks of television is an important factor in what happened to Hollywood filmmaking 10 or 15 years later in the 70s. Diller 
was a expert at selling ideas, packaging ideas, simple ideas. And he was briefly kind of in conflict <laughs> with the movie industry um, in the late 60s when he developed the idea of the ABC Movie of the Week that some of you older folks might remember, which was a made-for-television movie that ABC used to run on Sunday nights, a kind of 90-minute movie that would run over two hours with commercial breaks and so on. And this was one of the things in the 60s, as I've mentioned earlier, was uh, the film industry star as competition. Like, movies on TV, what are we going to do? People don't have to go out and, and buy a ticket anymore. Um, that was Diller's baby. Um, as Evans was leaving Paramount, he actually left in 74, 75, they first replaced him with another creative, Richard Silbert, who was a production designer, who did production design on Chinatown, for example, Shampoo, um, a lot of the great production design of the 70s. Um, and he ran Paramount for a couple of years, but Blue Dorn and Gulf Western deemed him too artsy, too literary. Um, and they also recognized what was going on with the blockbuster. They needed somebody who had a better instinct for that selling the product to as wide a population as possible. And that was the beginning of Barry Diller's rise. And he became the head of Paramount. And he assembled a group of producers underneath him that were called at the time Diller's Killers. Um, that include Jeffrey Katzenberg, who would later go on to be the head of animation at Disney, and then one of the founders of DreamWorks. He's the K in SKG. Michael Eisner, who would go on to run Disney in its sort of resurgent years in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, Don Simpson, who famously paired with Jerry Bruckheimer later. Simpson Bruckheimer with films like The Rock and, and so many other big action films. And, and Don Steele, who in the 80s would actually go on to run Columbia pictures as one of the first female heads of a studio. These people all worked for Diller and they all had Diller's financial acumen. They understood budgets. They also had a commitment, a serious commitment to Diller's idea of selling the high concept film. And this became the predominant ethos at Paramount. And Paramount shifted slowly in the late 70s from a studio of artistic success, Chinatown, to a studio that would get into the Indiana Jones game, <laughs> which is a great film, but a very different kind of film, the blockbuster. And Paramount became a blockbuster studio under Diller's stewardship. And the reason these guys were called Diller's Killers is because <laughs> They didn't care who you were. They didn't care about your pedigree. They didn't care about your last film. What they cared about was, do you have the product that we can sell? And this was a very different ethos. This was a very different ideology behind, you know, the conception of what a Hollywood film could or should be. It's returned to this sort of classical era notion of film as a product. Now, for that to work, the product had to be good, and Raiders of the Lost Ark is good. But it also meant that it had to be high concept, and that didn't leave room for the ambiguity of New Hollywood films. That didn't leave room for the anti-heroes, for the dark antagonists, for the troubled women for the um, questioning of American values. Those things don't fit in a film that we want to sell to as wide a possible audience, right? Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark is one of my favorite blockbusters. It's not hard to sell punching Nazis to most of America because within, embedded in the ideology of America is we stopped the Nazis. We often leave the Soviet Union out of this equation. 
uh, we stopped the Nazis. That's one of our shining moments. And, and in defeating the Nazis, the United States became the dominant power in the world, and so on. This is a, a, an easy ideology to tap into. Not that there's anything wrong with taking out some Nazis. It's great. But that's a lot different from looking at something like Taxi Driver, where American society has kind of turned its back on a veteran, turned its back on mental health issues, and where you have a New York City that's sort of festering under the weight of drugs and prostitution and, and a kind of rampant, unregulated violence. Go punch a Nazi, watch a, a scummy vigilante kill some pimps. <laughs> I mean, taxi driver's great, but what I'm thinking about or what I'm trying to convey to you is like, what's dealers thinking? What are the killers thinking? They're thinking, we want moms to take their kids to this movie. No mom's gonna take their kid to Taxi Driver, right? I remember, to age myself a little bit, when my parents went to see Raging Bull. They couldn't get a babysitter for me. I'm like, oh, we're gonna see this movie. They knew that it had swears and violence and all this sort of stuff, so they didn't want to take me to it, but they couldn't get someone to watch me. <laughs> So they're like, well, you can go see another movie. There's this historical movie that you can go see. The Elephant Man. So I went in, I'm 10 years old. Maybe I was even nine then. <laughs> Sat down alone. There were like eight other people in the cinema and watched The Elephant Man by myself. I think Raging Bull might have traumatized me less. Interestingly, both black and white, both featuring the line, I'm not an animal. That's for another video, maybe. Um... The point being, my mom took me to see Raiders of the Lost Ark like three or four times. That's a blockbuster. That's cha-ching. That's the money. And that became the ethos in late 70s Hollywood that allowed the blockbuster era to flourish and the new Hollywood era to wither and eventually die. Another figure worth mentioning is a man named Kirk Kerkorian. And Kerkorian is a little bit difficult to report on because he was kind of an enigmatic figure, even though he played a huge role in shaping American entertainment in the second half of the 20th century. Kerkorian was an Armenian American, and his is a real rags to riches story. He was the son of a fruit peddler and slowly you know, through that sort of hard grit and determination of the second generation immigrant, um, worked his way into the real estate world in the 40s and into the 50s. And he saw something that few people saw, but that made him extremely rich, was that Las Vegas was going to happen. And as resorts, the first couple of resorts started to open in Las Vegas, Kerkorian's first instinct was not to go and open his own resort, which he would eventually, but to buy up Las Vegas real estate. So he started buying plots of real estate adjacent to and further out from the original sort of kernel of the strip. And this eventually made him a very extremely rich man. Also a secretive one, not in the sort of paranoid way of Howard Hughes, but just someone who sort of deigned his privacy important, who eschewed flagrant displays of wealth. You know, he was different from some of the billionaires today who were like, look at my money. I'm going to be president. I'm going to go to space. He, he, he kept his, his private life closely guarded. But as a real estate entrepreneur, he played a huge role in making Las Vegas what it is today because he recognized, differently from the organized crime uh, players in Las Vegas, like Bugsy Siegel and all, that Las Vegas could, uh, again, like the movies, like Barry Diller's vision of the movies, could attract a wide array of tourists and visitors. And they would especially come if there were huge, lush, beautiful, beautiful, 
hotel casinos. And this is what Krikorian developed. And he's the person who built the Grand Hotel, the MGM Hotel, the MGM Grand, and so on. That became some of the, I mean, two of them at the time they were built, maybe three of them were the biggest hotels in the world when they were built. And you noticed that a couple of those hotels were called MGM. Krikorian bought MGM. He would end up actually buying and selling MGM a couple times. And he was another person who wasn't a movie person. He was a real estate developer and he saw the sort of early synergy between movie glamour and Las Vegas as a tourist destination, which is why he called his hotels MGM, MGM Grand bring people to the allure of Hollywood, which is only, you know, a few hours away. When he bought MGM, it was struggling financially, just as all the other ones were. One of Krikorian's ideas, and this would come to affect a lot of the studios throughout the 70s and 80s, was to sell off its assets. He sold Dorothy's ruby slippers. He sold props. He sold the rights to back catalogs. He sold parts of movie lots and more parts of movie lots and stripped MGM down to a kind of bare bones. This, remember, MGM in the 30s, 40s, and into the 50s was the sort of jewel in the Hollywood studio system. And he stripped it down to a well-functioning but bare bones studio. That would help it later when it had to bail out United Artists, which I'll talk about in the next video. But this kind of approach to realigning studios differed from the idea that these places are a repository of one of America's greatest sort of cultural outputs and that there's a, there's a place for the MGM library, of course, they didn't know that home video and then eventually streaming was going to be a factor. Um, they didn't know that Hollywood memorabilia was become was going to become such a huge money maker and so on. For him, it was just like, how do we keep the studio running? Let's get rid of the fat. Krikorian and a lot of men like him, and, and there are many more that I could talk about, played a huge role in influencing the development of Hollywood in the 70s also because they were bottom line guys. Kerkorian wanted MGM for its name and he wanted the studio to keep functioning. He wanted the glamour and the allure of the lion so he could use them in Las Vegas to promote his casinos. So the studio had to keep working to maintain that allure, but all the other stuff didn't matter as much. And the studio had to keep making films that would make money and all of the other stuff didn't matter as much. And he would eventually own parts at different times for the 70s and 80s of other studios. He owned 5% of Columbia for a little while. And he would get sort of knocked back by antitrust laws and then find other ways to own stakes in other entertainments and, and studios throughout the 70s and 80s. And he became very rich because of it. And later in his life, he did become quite a uh, well-respected philanthropist. Um, He's often painted, because he's so secretive, as a sort of villain in the new Hollywood story, or at least a sort of um, ambivalent villain. I'm not sure if that's the case. I don't think that he was malevolent in his dismantling of MGM. I think he just didn't care about all that a studio could be and all that a studio could offer. He saw a company in financial straits, and this would become the sort of ethos of the 1980s. So he stripped its assets away and kept the bare bones there so he could keep the name alive and benefit from it himself. And so when you look at somebody like Krikorian and somebody like Barry Diller, and as I said at the top, there are many more, it's not just these two, but there are lots of men and some women who are re reconfiguring the studios into lean, almost cynical money makers. And those kinds of companies benefit massively 
Trump blockbuster films. And by the end of the 1970s, I told an anecdote early in the series where Paul Schrader would say, you know, we would just walk into the producer's office or we would just walk into the studio executive's office and say, let me tell you how I'm going to make you money. There's no Paul Schrader doing that in 1978. There's no Paul Schrader doing that in 1980. Those days were over because Barry Diller and Kirk Corian and Michael Eisner, they knew how to make money and they didn't need some artsy upstart movie brat to tell them how to do their job. In fact, if the upstart movie brat wasn't going to get in line with Diller, they weren't going to have the opportunity to make the film. This was a huge realignment. Although, in terms of how the studios were set up as parts of bigger conglomerates, as synergistic companies selling lunchboxes and novelizations, it was very different from the 40s and 50s. That kind of re-entrenchment of top-down power was very similar. And in this way, as I said at the top of the film, by the end of the 1970s, the man the money men, the suits, had retaken control of the Hollywood system. Thanks for watching, everybody. I got a couple more videos in this series. Next up, we're going to talk about how did the artists bring it upon themselves? Director Hubris in the late 1970s. And then I'm going to wrap it up with a sort of discussion about the 1980s cultural changes and sort of why American audiences who had been so ready for Taxi Driver and so ready for The French Connection were now ready for E.T. and Top Gun. Um, those will be coming in the next week or so. Until then, I'd love it if you'd hit like, hit subscribe, share my videos, leave a comment. I try to engage. Um, and until next time, my name's Aaron Hunter. Keep watching movies.